It is 630. And at this point in time, actually, sorry. I'm going to move to open the FY23 budget hearing at 6.31 p.m. tonight, March 1st, 2022. Do I have a second? I think that was Amy. Thanks, Amy. And uh, any discussion? No, I don't think I need to ask for discussion to open a hearing. I'm gonna vote yes. Karen? Yes. Sean? Yes. Rich. Yes. Mary. Yes. Joe. Yes. Steve. Yes. Sharon. Yes. Mike. Yes. Brett. Yes. And Amy. Yes. Fantastic. So the budget hearing is open. Um, the agenda that we've planned um, kind of gives over to the superintendent the meeting just so that he can run a presentation for us and help us better understand any of the more um, recent changes, et cetera. So Kirk, I'll, I'll turn it over to you. Great, thank you very much. Um, and Madam Chair, I am gonna go um, share my screen here as I'm in, in the meeting in two places. Um, so let me just get that all put together. Very good. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, School Committee, and to our residents that have joined us for the budget hearing today. Um, this budget hearing is going to be somewhat repetitive. If you've seen a couple of budget presentations this season, uh, it's in an effort to, to uh, continue to educate our community on the crafting and construction of the budget, and then uh, we will go over the numbers for this year. So to begin. As I presented to the to the joint FinCOMs on February 18th, excuse me, I'm having, um, we're gonna start by explaining the budget using the FY22 numbers. And in FY22, we had a budget of just over $59 million. So how do we come to that number? Well, the state, uh, we start with the foundation budget. This is derived value of the minimum district spending requirement by the state, and that number was $34 million, greater than $34 million. And that is gathered by looking at the required minimum local contribution of each of the three towns that particular year. When you combine up the minimum contribution of the three towns, you came to a total of almost $27 million in minimum local contribution that is required. So chapter 70 aid is added to that. Chapter 70 aid is a based upon uh, your wealth and population in your school district. So when you combine your chapter 70 aid to your required minimum local contribution, you come up with the foundation budget. So as you can see, the chapter 70 aid is determined by the state based upon enrollment and high needs populations. And the minimum uh, required minimum local contribution is the wealth factor determined by the state. And that is based on median household income and value of property assets within the towns. So to come to a budget of just over $59 million, we take the foundation budget and we have to look at other revenue to get to that number. So in FY22, to help get to that number, $1.2 million of excess and deficiency was contributed to the budget. Now, with the e and &E to offset that, there's other sources of local revenue as seen on the revenue slide. We use these slides so that when we get to this year's numbers later, as you can see that. So chapter 70 and regional transportation numbers are numbers that are provided by the state. So we already use chapter 70 in our foundation budget, but we do get a regional transportation reimbursement, and that allows us to provide transportation without charging our families. And it's a subsidy, does not pay for the entire uh, uh, bill of transportation. We talked about the E&D appropriation. Medicaid re revenue is a reimbursement based upon uh, medical needs of students um, that we're required to give, and we get reimbursement for the cost of those. 
And then we have investment income, charter school, and other revenue that come to us at a local level to help craft the budget. Charter school is a reimbursement of students that live within our towns attending charter schools. The other revenue can be as simple as um, um, decommissioning assets and selling them at an auction. Um, and investment income uh, is based on the, those assets. So our debt assessment also helps us get to that because each town has to fund their portion of the debt assessment. So currently, uh, the high school building upgrade, the turf field, the leach field, and the current feasibility study are all costs within the debt assessment that are shared by each town, and the formula is derived within the regional agreement. So, the variable assessments for each town is based on their sh fair share uh, based on the regional agreement. So, when you take those revenues, this is the last part that's left over. And so in FY22, you can see the amounts combined for $20.7 million in total variable assessment. And this is the number that can have some changes year over year to our towns. So when you combine our fixed assessments with Chapter 70 local aid, the total variable assessments, and the debt assessments, you come to the total budget. So let's take a moment to explain the assessment. Why do our total assessments change year over year? Well, as we just described, we have our minimum local contribution plus the death assessment plus the total variable assessment equals the total assessment of the towns. So the minimum local contribution known as the wealth factor is shown in the previous five fiscal years for each town. And what you'll notice is that this number is determined by the state. And during that period of time, you'll see the town of Stowe has remained relatively flat compared to the other towns with a slight increase, as opposed to the town of Lancaster has had a significant $800,000 increase over that same period of time and the town of Bolton, close to that as well, 800,000. And what we can derive from that is that the wealth factor, in other words, the value of property value increases over that period of time relative to the median household income has increased at a greater rate in these two towns, in Bolton and Lancaster, than in Stowe. It can be expressed in this graph here. So you can see Bolton and Lancaster are increasing while Stowe has remained flat with a very minimal increase over the last five fiscal years. So how are they calculated? Well, they're calculated by taking the aggregate of the previous five years to get a total enrollment and then understanding the proportion each shares. So the five-year total in FY22, Bolton was 32.9, Lancaster 30.6, Stowe, 36.4. So when you look at the five-year enrollment aggregate over that same period of time, it's interesting to note that in FY18, the total number for Stowe of students participating um, in the school system was 6,386. And in FY22, it reduced by almost 500 students. In Lancaster, it is reduced, but only by rate of about 70 students. And in Bolton, it's reduced at a rate of about 70 students. So you can see that uh, enrollment has decreased over time. And in the presentation I gave to the regional uh, committee, uh, I was able to explain that that was due not to necessarily other choices being made, but due to general uh, school age children census data decreasing during that time. With the exception of we have seen a bump up in enrollment in uh, Stowe for um, the Minuteman uh, te Technical High School. So here's how that enrollment trend looks over five years. You can see the enrollment has decreased in Stowe rep to the relative flatness of Bolton and Lancaster. So you can see 
that factor combined with the factor of the minimum local contribution or the wealth factor has serious budget implications. So if we look at the five-year aggregate by the fiscal year, this is expressed in percentages. You can see Stowe's percentage, their fair share as determined by the regional agreement has decreased over that five-year period. Bolton's and Lancaster's has both increased over that five-year period. And these are the terms laid out in the regional agreement. So the variable assessment in dollars over that same period of time are expressed here. It expresses the same trend as the previous slides did and can be expressed in this line graph. As we see over the past four years, Stowe has remained flat in terms of their proportion, proportionate share with a slight decrease. The other two towns are increasing. So in terms of the debt assessment, this is, these are the changes in the debt assessment uh, for those things that we outlined that are responsible to the high school. So when you take the minimum local contribution and you add the variable assessment and you add the debt assessment, that equals, oh, excuse me, hit the wrong button. That equals each town's total assessment. So you can see what the total assessment responsibilities have been for each of the each town over that same period of time. And it reflects the same trend described in the minimum local contribution as well as calculating the variable assessment. So in other words, it can compound that effect as wealth goes up uh, in a town in relative terms and wealth remains static in another town in relative terms combined with a decrease in enrollment for that town. So here's what the total assessments looks like in terms of that distribute, that growth rate. And this is expressed in that percentage change year over year as a result of that. So when I first came on board, people asked me to discover why it is that Stowe has had a decrease in assessment over the past couple of years. And I hope that this slideshow expresses that. Again, this is the presentation uh, that was given to the uh, joint FinCom committees just a couple of weeks ago. Uh, and we'll continue to use this tool as a way to educate our communities. So with that, we'll now get into part three, uh, the FY23 uh, preliminary, or excuse me, that should say the uh, budget hearing. Please excuse me for that, <coughs> I didn't update that slide. Uh, and I would like to bring in uh, uh, Pat Maroney, our Director of Business and Operations, uh, to speak to these slides. And Pat, I will cue the slides on your cue. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Superintendent Downing. Um, I'm bringing to you tonight um, the fiscal year 23 budget in the amount of $62,225,818. This represents a 5.25% increase from last year's expenditure budget. Next slide, please. For revenue, I want you to note um, some of the changes that we have. Um, we, this year, we got a significant increase in chapter 70 education aid, um, and that is due to SOA if that is the correct. And that would be the Student Opportunity Act funding that right. was uh, added to just, Chapter 78 across the state. I just drew a blank, I'm sorry about that. Yeah. And also I just wanna make note of the fact that we are still funding the budget with $1.2 million from our excess and deficiency. Uh, everything else seems to um, be about the same except for the assessments which again, as you would just explained, is variable and um, mostly um, driven by the changes that um, Superintendent Downing just went through. Here is a trend for our chapter 70. You can see over the years, um, it, it goes up very slightly. Um, in fiscal year 22, we, we received the funding for the, um, the children that are attending full day kindergarten. That would 
uh, that would account for the big um, bump that you see from 21 to 22. And in 23, uh, like I said, the $1.2 million increase um, is due to that SOA as mentioned. Next slide, please. This is a, our historical use of excess and, and deficiency. As you can see at one point, uh, if you go back as far as 2017, we started out using a million dollars at that point and we were pretty consistent and then um, thought that it was in the best interest of the district that we start to get off the wheel as it's called, um, the hamster wheel of continuing to use E&D as a funding source for our budget every year. And we actually in fiscal year 2020, we were able to go down as low as um, 750,000. In fiscal year 21, um, I just wanna indicate that you can see where the full day kindergarten was funded from additional funds that were in um, revolving funds um, and were pulled from E&D as well. And then last two years, okay, um, thank you. Um, minimum local contribution as discussed by Superintendent Downing. Um, this is where we are today. These are the new state numbers. Um, they represent $28,095,417. Next. And again, the assessment breakdown as discussed before, you take our proposed budget, you remove the high school debt, the local revenue, which is um, chapter 70, um, e and and other revenue generated by the state. And you come up with the total amount assessed. Then the fixed assessment, as I just said, um, the minimum required local contribution is then backed out of that number. And you come down to a variable assessment of $21,441,211. So um, that's the number that we're in the variable portion. For the five-year aggregate, um, you can see where we are today. Um, again, um, we, um, Superintendent Downing was talking about the trend of things going down um, in, in some of our communities, um, in Stowe in particular. So our operating assessments, the numbers are there, 32.9, 30.6, and 36.4. And high school enrollment for capital as well. Um, the uh, but that would be for the expenditures related to debt and any major capital expenditure that was strictly related to the high school. That would be the assessment uh, percentage that we would use in the budget. Next page. This is our assessment for fiscal year 23, um, based on the 20 the 62 million dollar budget. It's 3.9% for Bolton, Lancaster at 5.39%, and Stowe at 2.64%. So you can see also in the column next to that, the total dollar increases for the town of Bolton would be 636,000, Lancaster 745,000, and Stowe 476,000. So this year, uh, we are only going to be bringing three new positions, but they will not be new FTE to the budget. We are actually going to bring uh, these programs in using current FTE that we have um, as we look at our enrollment and, and uh, anticipated FTE. So we're going to add a special 0.5 special education teacher at the center school, a 0.4 BCBA at the Florence Sawyer School, and a 0.5 increase in school psychologist for the whole district. Um, that is a result of increased testing assignments uh, due to uh, uh, concerns of learning delays as a result of hybrid and remote learning during COVID. But again, what I would like to say is this is not an increase in benefits or in FTE because we are able to reallocate. So with that, we will take questions from the committee. Or I guess from the community as well, Madam Chair. Yes, indeed. Oh, good. So you stopped sharing. So it's um, probably best if people use their orange hand to raise uh, a question. 
That way I can see it quickly. I'll also say um, this hearing, this public hearing is not meant for school committee deliberation. So the school committee can kind of weigh in only in so much as asking kind of clarifying questions or asking somebody to expand upon what has just been said. We wanna kind of withhold any of our deliberation for the public meeting that will commence after this. So I just wonder if any of my committee members have any process questions for me. Just process. Sean, a process question? I can't, I can't hear you, Sean, are you on mute? Back in. Oh, I got, I hear you. Try that again. I'll go over to Mike as you solve the problem. Mike, what do you think? Um, I'm happy to defer it to Ellen Sturgis, whose hand went up before mine. Sturgis has the floor. Hi, Ellen. Hi. Uh, let me drop my hand down here. Um, so um, I guess I have two questions. One is, um, well, actually, I'll just keep to one. So when at the Finance Committee um, presentation, you talked about, and I don't know if it was ARPA money or it's something called, I think, way of clarified, it's called something different. You didn't yeah. talk about that here. Can you talk about that and how that's going to be used on the budget? So I think you're referring to the school version of that, which is uh, ESSER funding. ESSER. Yeah, that's that's the ESSER funding. Yeah, the ESSER funding is being utilized. Uh, that's a two-year grant currently being utilized um, uh, that helped us with our learning liaison, some additional nursing help, and um, next year, and also for our high school dean position. That high school dean position has been a grant-funded position the last two school years. We are keeping that as a grant-funded position for next year. Um, and then as a, a way to secure substitutes for next year, the substitute pool has been absolutely depleted and there isn't a substitute pool. Um, so we are gonna go with building-based subs so we can contract people for the entire year. Um, and it's on a one year only basis uh, on this grant as we work through this uh, difficult period. Um, and then I believe we also had um, a couple of lunchroom monitors in there for each of the three elementary schools uh, so that they could provide coverages uh, so that we are not utilizing uh, our paraeducators or special educators or others to do coverages at the risk of students not being provided services. Uh, we found that we ran up against those challenges all year this year and we must have some security for those, for those uh, moments next year. So those are new expenses, but they're covered by the ESSER money. That's not right. Is that what I'm understanding? That that's right. But they're one-time expenses, with the exception of the dean position. The dean position is a position, as I mentioned there, and to the school committee uh, on our original budget workshop that I intend to advance forward uh, for permanent status in the budget in for the FY24 budget. And then the only other new, as you said, the, the 1.4 new FTEs is actually just a reallocation. So there's no additional expense on those. It's just. Yes, that's correct. That's okay. correct. Thank you. No additional expenses there. Great. Thanks. Thanks, Alan, for those questions. And um, for my school committee members, if these are some things that you want to deliberate on later, please be taking notes, identify things that you want to kind of maybe probe a little bit deeper later on. Uh, go ahead, Mike. Well, actually, having said that, you're going to have to let me know if you would rather have me hold off this question until um, um, our deliberation. Um, so the questions that you want to focus on now are just to get or ask Kirk to maybe clarify something that was unclear. The community can certain, certainly probe, <laughs> ask probing questions, but the committee probably should wait to do any probing questions or deliberation to later. So is it clarifying? I think so. Can I just ask it and you can say yeah or nay? Go for it. All right. So I'm just, you know, as, as, as part of the um, part of our task on the budget and one subcommittee is to uh, ensure that our budget is being um, uh, reflective of the district's values as particular as they're outlined in the school improvement plan. 
And I'm just wondering if the superintendent can expand on that, uh, how we've um, uh, allocated funds to sort of represent our values as, as a district. Is that a fair question or should I hold off on deliberation? So that feels somewhat clarifying. Kirk, what do you think? Yeah, I think it is, absolutely it is. So we build this budget um, in, in terms of what we're, we're, we built our district improvement plan on. And as you know, we are currently in the entry process and we're gonna be going through the strategic planning process to build a five year strategic plan at the end of the school year. Currently our goals are based in social emotional learning um, creating learning environments and structures that are, are conducive for empowerment, to look at our um, um, uh, professional development for our staffs and empowering the, growing those learners and focusing really on developing and refining our literacy instruction and curriculum. And so we, the, our, our strategies are based on the fact that we're trying to advance these goals in order to ensure that uh, we're hitting really sort of a, um, an accelerated target, if you will. We have to hit the target of what we would under, under just standard times for our students, but we're in a period of accelerated learning for our students for any gaps or, or lags that are, happened as a result of, of uh, remote and hybrid learning. And I'll just remind the community and the committee that uh, uh, Dr. McGuire spoke to the accelerated learning program very early in the school year and our strategies for that. So it, this is gonna be a multi-year process. Um, and as I, one of the elements uh, details within the budget is the onboarding of the Renaissance Learning Platform uh, in, in reading and math as a major instrument we'll need to diagnose uh, learning gaps or learning lags and provide instruction to that. So this budget put forward is gonna help us advance those, um, those goals. That's great. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks, Mike. Thanks, Kirk. If any of our community members would like to ask a question, please feel free to put that little golden hand up. Any questions that you might have? There are no silly questions. Sean. Yeah. Can you hear me okay? Yes. All right. Perfect. Um, Kirk, just a real quick question. I know you had met with the uh, finance committees of the respective towns. Did they sort of give an impact on what our budget is going to do to their communities? Well, that's a fine question. Um, they did. Uh, I, I will say that the town of Lancaster came out as most concerned. As you can see, the assessments with them being at 5.39%. And at the time it was higher because we hadn't completed uh, our negotiations. Um, getting them to 5.39% was quite a chore. So there were some concerns there. Um, I did hear from uh, the representatives from Stowe and Bolton uh, that they thought these man numbers were going to be manageable numbers for them to work with. I, but I would not be speaking fairly if I did not say that they also expressed um, the concern for their colleagues in Lancaster and for their neighbors in Lancaster as well. And it's, I have to sh share with the committee, looking at the structure and design of the regional agreement and how the school system is funded, there's always gonna be that toggle of higher, of peaks and valleys in the budget. And, and I'm not quite sure how to solve that one long-term. Um, but, but I do know that the town of Lancaster came forward as, as having con some concerns about meeting that number. So my hope is that by getting down to 5.39, we were able to get much closer to the target that they need to get to. So thank you for your question, Mr. Windsor. No, I appreciate it. Thank you. Okay, feel free to put that golden hand up if you have any additional questions.
Okay. What do you think, Amy? I think this is a clarifying question that might be a benefit for the public um, that's here or watching in the future. So last year was my first time through this whole process. And I recall there being a timing issue where, you know, the budget's presented in March, but things are still kind of shaking out in April. And um, I'm wondering if that's, if we should be expecting the same um, type of situation this year, because I haven't really heard as much discussion about that this time around. Sure, so Ms. Cohen, what I, what I can share with you is that I wasn't here last year to, to know what that experience was, uh, but we do have our chapter $70 in, and we do have our negotiations while uh, agreed to, not officially um, approved by both parties, uh, the two major elements of the budget that, that contribute to the budget construction there have been, uh, in my mind, settled. So I would not see any drastic differences in our revenue sources, but I will at this point turn it over to our expert, Ms. Moroni, to mm -hmm. add any light to that that she would like to add. Pat? Sorry. <laughs> um, could you repeat the end of that question, please? I, I, yeah, I just wasn't sure if um, the numbers are still a little bit in flux because it's March. And I recall last year there being some decisions that couldn't be made until April. Um, um, I'm, I'm sorry, I couldn't hear you before. Your that's okay. brain was freezing and, and I only heard bits and pieces of what you said. Mm -hmm. um, at this point, um, again, we have the governor's numbers and that's what we're basing this budget off. Typically, any changes um, are minimal, if, if any, by the end of the year. Um, the only thing that may be different um, is if they change any projections, say, in, um, in one of our um, like regional transportation numbers right now. But I'm following the trends, and things seem to stay in line. So I'm, I'm not expecting anything in addition. So right now, I think this is pretty much where we're going to end the year. Um, and so that's about it. Okay, all right, thank you for that clarification. You're welcome. I see Kendra Dickinson would like to speak. Go right ahead. Hi there, thank you, I appreciate it. And forgive me, this is a little bit of a new road for me and I stepped into the meeting a hair late because we were just finishing up dinner. In terms of the comments regarding Stowe and Bolton's concern for you know, Lancaster's um, ability to saddle the budget concern. Is Does this also encompass the building of the new high school? I know that there's been a lot of conversation um, amongst the residents of Lancaster regarding property taxes, how they're increasing, you know, how to get more tax, commercial tax revenue, et cetera. And the budget holes, not only for the building of the new high school and how Lancaster's gonna contribute to that build, but also, you know, property taxes, et cetera, has been a hot conversation in town. So I'm just kind of looking to connect the two smartly so I can understand, you know, where that concern from our neighbors are, are coming from. Thank you, Ms. Dickinson. Uh, no, it was isolated specifically to the FY23 budget. And when I say that they express their concerns, I would say with an, through, through an empathetic tone, um, not ability to, to get to where we need to get to, but certainly expressing uh, their, their, their empathy that uh, that could be difficult for Lancaster having a higher assessment than the other two towns. And just to piggyback on that, if I may, um, did I miss the line item in the 2023 budget that addressed Lancaster's contribution to the building of the new high school? Uh, there, there isn't a contribution to the building of the new high school yet because a budget has not been established for the new high school. That won't come along for a, over a year, perhaps to a year and a half. Uh, we're, that's way down the road for us. Okay. And just to clarify, because we are a regional school district, um, with that budget, when it does get presented, it, do Bolton, Stowe, and Lancaster contribute equally? Uh, they... It is 
I believe, based upon the regional agreement as well. And it will, um, it requires all three towns to support the building project. Okay, very good. Thank you. I appreciate the clarification. You bet. I will, so I'll, I'll add to that just a little bit, Kendra, and say that the feasibility study debt assessment is in this budget. So the feasibility study oh. that we voted on um, last year, which was $1.5 million divided amongst the three towns, that um, servicing that debt is in this budget, in addition to other debt assessments that are, you know, sprinkled across or just relevant to, I think, just the high school, um, because that's the only building that we all share. Otherwise, the towns have to manage the capital assessments of their buildings separately on the warrants. So you will see the feasibility study in there. And remember that if we vote to fund the entire project down the road, then the feasibility study will be subsidized by the MSBA at a certain percentage yet to be determined. But center school was subsidized at 50%, if that helps. No, that's a huge help. Thank you. I appreciate that. Sure. Scrolling, looking for hands. on the budget. Joe, you want to take it away? Yeah, can you hear me all right, Leah? You can, because I'm you're kind of tinny on my end. Um, huh. Not meaning to be the wet blanket here, but I am looking at the agenda and um, the time is 7.08 and we're not seeing a lot of questions. So if there's not gonna be any questions, Madam Chair, our agenda provides for a 6.50 start for our school committee meeting. I'm actually gonna to move to close the public hearing at this time. Second. Thank you, I think that was Rich. Yes, ma'am. Um, however, I am seeing Mike King's hand come up and Mike, is this a budget hearing question? It is not. It is not. Uh, I just wanted to clarify, we're going to have uh, com public comment coming up. Um, yeah, so the agenda, okay. the agenda calls for us closing this hearing first so that we can then move into the public uh, meeting. Understood. Thank you. <laughs> okay, no problem. Second. Yeah, great. So I think Rich already seconded it, but I appreciate that, Steve. Um, is there any discussion on the motion? No. Okay, let's move to vote. So Joe. Yes. Myself, yes. Sean? Yes. Mary? Yes. Karen? Yes. Sharon? Yes. Amy? Yes. Rich? Yes, ma'am. Steve? Yes. Brett? Yes. Mike? Yes. And I think that's everybody. Did I get everybody? All right, the hearing is officially closed. Thanks, Joe. Uh, so at this point, I would like to ask all the members of the community who are not signed up for public comment to kindly exit the Zoom and you can find us on YouTube if you'd like to um, continue paying attention to the meeting. So we can just wait for everybody to jump out. But I do have six community members who should remain. And in case you're um, not sure if you're one of them, it is Sarah Cochis, Colleen Cochran, Vince LaRosa, Keeley, Nowasaki, Dana Ellis, and Michael King. And we're gonna communicate, or rather give our public comments in that order. Just gonna give everybody a minute to do what they need to do to exit or join.
Alita, if you wouldn't mind helping. Um, create a guest list here. I'm not sure who Patty's iPhone is. Uh, nor am I. And I don't think that Patty is on our list. Okay, I think she just, she's on there. Krista White. Chris, are you there? Would you mind uh, moving over to YouTube as opposed to staying in the Zoom? Is that right, Alita? What was that? I think we have uh, everybody we need. Uh, Krista White and Pat Patricia's iPhone. Oh, are they still in? Okay. Yes. Should I move them? I move them over. Yeah. yeah. Hey, Leah. Yes. Just so you know, when you sit back, we lose some of your audio. I don't think it's just me. I think it's a few people. So. Oh, okay. No worries. Just to warn you. How is it now? Very good. Okay. Yeah, it's almost like you switch um, to some external mic. We can't really hear you that well. Okay, I'll stay close so you can see the whites of my eyes. The only question I have is Kristen. Okay. Kristen can hear us. Okay. I guess just remove, perhaps they're not present. Okay, so, all right, everybody. So at this point in time, I'd like to call the public meeting to order at 7.13 p.m. Um, we will also, sorry, I'm just pulling up my agenda. We'll also start with the Pledge of Allegiance, if you don't mind. So please everybody mute and you can rise or if you choose to and recite the pledge with us. So I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. Thanks Kirk, great flag. All right, everybody. Uh, so as we proceed with the meeting here, uh, our first item on the agenda is of course, citizens comments. And so we have um, six community members present with us tonight. And the order just so that everybody is clear is going to be Sarah, then Colleen, then Vince, then Keely, then Dana, then Michael. Um, I emailed all of you guys the policy around citizens comments. We're happy to have you all here. I would just like to ask politely if you could stay within the three minute limit. And if you find that somebody before you has already um, kind of said what you were going to say, you can simply say that you are in agreement and add perhaps any details that they didn't cover from what you had wanted to say so that we don't have a you know, full blown repetition every single time. So I hope nobody steals your thunder and that everybody gets to say what they wanna say. So we're gonna start with Sarah. Hi, Sarah. Hi everyone, <clears throat> my name is Sarah Kochas and I am from Bolton. My husband Steve and I <clears throat> have five children, three attending Florence Store at this time. We absolutely love this community are, are fully invested in serving it. I'm a pediatric nurse practitioner with nearly 20 years of experience as well as a school council member at Florence Sawyer School. My husband Steve is a full-time Bolton firefighter EMT and has served our town for nearly six years. Both of us have cared for COVID patients throughout this pandemic. I am speaking here tonight to urge our school committee members to end the mask mandate in our district effective immediately. Furthermore, I ask that there be no plans to reinstate a mask mandate as proposed by Superintendent Downing. As parents, we have the particular duty and directive to protect our children and determine what is in their best interest. 
Over the course of the past 718 days of this pandemic, I have seen a very disturbing trend where public policy and mandates have highly prioritized the needs of adults while sacrificing the needs of children and sidelining the rights of parents. The studies are now showing what many of us feared, that most of the measures that have been used to stop the spread of COVID have been largely ineffective and been harmful to our children. With regards to masking, this is particularly true, as studies are now showing that masking children is not effective in stopping the spread of COVID, especially with the new Omicron variant. I have seen the harmful effects of masking my own children. They have played soccer with masks in 100 degree heat with oppressive humidity, sweltered in classrooms reaching 104 degrees without so much as a fan, sat at lunch unmasking to eat and masking to talk, performed plays and played instruments while masked. They have been sad about not seeing their friends and teachers' faces and frustrated at the strange and contradictory rules. I have seen it most acutely with the learning loss and learning issues with our second grade child. Masking is very abnormal and decisively against our human nature. Therefore, it should only be utilized if the benefits outweigh the risks. Now that we have nearly two years of data and anecdotal evidence to evaluate, we can see that the benefits of masking are negligible and the real and potential harms are great. Documented harms to children include a sharp and alarming increase in mental health issues and suicidality, learning loss, speech delays, and problem socializing. It is clear that this list of harms will only continue to grow longer and more alarming as time goes on. A popular line over the last two years has been, children are resilient. While this may be true, I reject the premise of this statement because it diminishes the fact that children are easily traumatized. Therefore, we must rigorously evaluate any measure that is imposed upon our children. It has been especially frustrating that this ability has been stripped from us as parents. Given that the mask they have been made to wear is not affected for its intended purpose and has harmful effects, I propose this question to the committee. Who has the authority, responsibility, and unique ability to determine whether my children wear a mask? I say this authority and responsibility belongs to Steve and me. We are the ones who care most deeply for the welfare of our children, Mason, Aiden, Maeve, Fiona, and Marin. We alone have the unique right to weigh the risks and benefits of masking and to determine whether it should be used for our children above any local, state, or federal institution. Therefore, I implore this committee, please take action to stop this mask mandate immediately without any added metrics for reinstatement as this right should be exercised only by the parents. Thank you. Thanks, Sarah. Appreciate it. And I think I see Keely in the box, but Keely, do would you mind please putting your name in the box? It just says iPhone. Thanks. So guys, moving on to our next uh, citizen's comment, it will go to Colleen Cochran. Before Colleen goes, I, I can't figure out how to do it. Oh, because it's on an iPhone? Yeah. Keely, I, mean, I, got, it. Keely, I, I got it. I got it for you, Keely. Thanks, Alita. You're welcome. Thank you. Great. Okay, is Colleen present? I am here. Can you hear me? Fantastic. Yes, go right ahead. Okay, my name is Colleen Corcoran. My husband and I live in Bolton and we have children at Florence Sawyer School. I am a registered nurse who works in pediatric intensive care at a large children's hospital. I care for critically ill and dying children and their families every week. I have dedicated over a decade of my life to this calling and I'm very passionate about the well being of children. My personal and professional experience before and during this pandemic shaped the way I care for my own children. For example, I've seen traumas that make me reevaluate certain risk-taking activities and others that solidify my plans to keep my children in the backseat of the car until their bodies were ready. You can be assured that if masks were saving my children from any serious harms, mine would be the last to remove theirs. As their parents, my husband and I determine the level of risk tolerance for our children. And let's talk about mask efficacy. We don't need studies to show us whether masks are working or not. We have logic, common sense, and the ability to look around our community and see that they have not stopped the spread of COVID. Masks of all shapes, sizes, and styles have been employed, employed often incorrectly for two years now. And has COVID been eradicated? No. Also, where is the control group to show what would have happened if we didn't apply the mask mandates at all? There's a chance that we could have been better off. And by all means, if community members feel safe wearing their masks and prefer to do so, 
that is their choice. But for kids, masks are not a benign intervention and mandating them for all children going forward is unacceptable. This leads me to address the significant uptick in the behavioral health population. We have consistently had a large number of children, some as young as eight years old, with thoughts of suicide and homicide, suicide attempts, self-injurious behavior, aggressive and violent behaviors, and attempts to injure others. They're waiting in emergency rooms for days to get an inpatient bed or to be transferred to another institution where they can be cared for. The isolation, loss of normal social gatherings, inability to connect and see smiles and expressions of their friends, teachers, and coaches due to forced masking is a major contributing factor to this crisis. In my opinion, we have failed the youth of America by refusing to acknowledge these facts sooner and intervene appropriately. Mental health issues are not just stigmatized and largely ignored in the adult population, it's happening in pediatrics as well. These children are suffering in silence and so much of it was avoidable. Some detrimental effects will not be, likely won't be realized for years to come, but some are evident right now. Anyone who has read about child development knows the importance of children seeing faces and expressions. It's fundamental to their brain development and we have been depriving them of that simple yet crucial experience for two years. We've sacrificed our children's well-being as a whole for the protection of all adults when we should have been focusing our efforts on protecting the high risk population. In light of my experiences, I am once again asking the committee for the parental choice to demask our children starting tomorrow, March 2nd. I also ask there be no plan to reinstate mandatory masking as proposed. I am tired of the goalposts constantly and arbitrarily being moved further and further away. And the petition sent to you with nearly 150 signatures of district members and parents shows that I am not alone. The recent policy changes around masking announced by the nation's health officials reflect the science and logic that myself and many others in the country have been quietly following for two years. However, only now is it acceptable to voice our beliefs without fear of being characterized as heartless and anti-science because the CDC is now more in step with us. I appreciate your time and consideration and thank you for your work as members of the committee. Thank you so much. And we'll move on to our next speaker and that is Vince Larissa. Hello and, and thank you for your time today. My name is Vince LaRosa and I'm an active member in the Bolton community. My wife Lauren and I love Bolton and are proud to raise our three children in this town. They currently attend Florence Sawyer School. I'm an advocate for the basic freedoms that anyone who wants to wear a mask should have the ability to do so. No one should have the right to take that freedom away. I also believe the same freedom should be extended to those who may feel the time has come to un unmask their children. I am sure we can all agree that it has been a roller coaster the last two years. And I just wanna take a minute to commend so many of the teachers and administrators who genuinely want what's best for our children, a place where the kids are feel safe, happy to learn, and most of all, not be judged. To simply hear and breathe freely in a safe environment. A sincere thanks to all of you for leading through this difficult time in our community. The US Surgeon General reported that depression and anxiety has doubled in our young children. The traumatic stress of our children and what they've endured by forced mask wearing, isolation, quarantining, and COVID safety measures over the past two years is immeasurable. And one may argue at this point far exceeds the risk of the virus itself. There is now new evidence that suggests my mask protects both me and you, it's simply no longer true. However, if masks work and you still have a genuine concern and want your child to wear one, then you should have nothing to worry about. It's time for us to end the psychological, physical, and emotional damage happening to our kids and never allow it to happen again. They've already lost too much time academically and rob of the years that are supposed to be the happiest times of their lives. They, ha they haven't seen the faces of their peers or their teachers inside their school since early 2020. I have never even seen a picture of my youngest daughter in a school without a mask on. I was pleased to see the new recommendations from the CDC. We have been told to follow the science since we began this struggle two years ago. Now is not the time to go against those recommendations and impose on the freedom of our community. Finally, Right now, some of you are shaking your heads in agreement and others are doing just the opposite. But isn't that so wonderful about living in a country that affords us those freedoms? Please don't try to take those basic freedoms away from the citizens in the Neshoba School District now. Thank you. Thank you very much. We'll move on to our next speaker and that's Keely Nowasaki. 
Good evening. Um, my name is Kaylee Nowasaki and I'm a resident of Stowe. Um, I have a six-year-old in kindergarten at Center School. Um, for months, the blame was on Desi and the state and your hands were tied as the school committee. This is no longer the case. This, the decision is now yours, but rather than go along with surrounding towns and cities, we are waiting on a decision. I have spoken countless times in regard to unmasking our children and returning health decisions to the family. Where there is risk, there must be choice. Instead, the district has allowed the risk to evolve. Anxiety, depression, delays are significantly increased in our children. In regard to delays, the CDC has gone far enough that they quietly lowered standards for childhood developmental milestones. Rather than 24 months, 50 word vocabulary has now moved to 30 months. Crawling is no longer considered a milestone and first steps have moved from 12 months to 15 months. This is absurd. The shift recognizes their failure to address the risks of their decisions, yet we should trust the recommendations. At this point, there is absolutely no reason to continue with the mask mandate. The change should be immediate and our children should never be put in such a position again. Allow parents to educate their children to be adaptable, resilient and capable so that they can create a future of their design. They do not need to be force fed emotional drama and how to deal with change. Over my vacation, my son turned six. We went to monster trucks, we went skiing, we went swimming, he plays hockey, we went out with friends, we went to a museum, we went to the mall, and we didn't wear masks on any of these occasions. We ended vacation with a birthday party and he was able to engage with his friends for a period of time that felt very normal. Um, they didn't stop smiling, they didn't stop talking, and they were silly the whole time. One child thanked my son for having a party and being able to be mask free. In such a happy time, that was extremely sad for me. Kids should not have to hold this burden and have to say such things. Despite the wording for health, this has always been about politics and pleasing a certain population. Follow the recommendations rather than the science. If this was about health, things would have changed months ago. The data has never supported masking. And if anything, the data has showed more and more ill effects of masking as time has gone on. Please stop the mask mandate immediately without any metrics. These children have gone through enough allow them to adapt immediately, just like they did at the start of this madness. They don't need to be lectured. Young children are innocent and don't see the harms. It's adults in the administrations that have pushed the fear in this agenda. People who choose to mask and people choose to unmask. This has been occurring outside of school from the start of this. Put an end to the mandate and allow families in the community to evolve with purpose. And as always, I appreciate your time. I appreciate your work. And please continue to nurture our children by making decisions that benefit them. Thanks, Keely. Let's Thank move you. on to our next speaker, and that is Dana Ellis. Is Dana present? Unfortunately not. So let's move on to Michael King. Good evening. My name is Michael King and I'm a resident of Lancaster with a six-year-old and Mary Rawlinson. Um, so again, we are remotely calling into an important meeting that will influence our children's future. Um, I wish to pose the question uh, to the board a second time why we are not meeting in person at this point. Um, I think the time has come. We can probably adopt a hybrid model going forward. Uh, regarding the topic of school masking, um, it really is astonishing to me that we are still in this situation two years later for a virus that poses negligible risk to our children. The facts have not changed over that period, just the politics. I'm happy to cite and debate dozens of gold standard studies. I did much painstaking research in the past, but it's clear to me that I don't think many people are going to look at that, and that's okay. This is an emotional time for everybody, I understand. The good news, however, for any remaining CNN viewers is that CNN's own Lena Wen and Scott Gottlieb publicly acknowledged on national TV last month that cloth and surgical masks are useless against an airborne virus and have been useless for the past two years. Whoops. N95s are little better and likely even detrimental without training, regular fit testing, and regular replacement. But since data doesn't seem to work and we're still in the cold weather months, everyone is welcome to step outside with an improperly fitted N95 mask and breathe. And that stuff coming out all around your mask are droplets freezing in the air. This virus is airborne and thus orders of magnitude smaller than even those droplets. And they persist in the air for well over eight hours. All of this at the same time, children have seen their average IQ nationwide drop over 20 points. They've been exposed to levels of carbon dioxide well beyond any OSHA standard. 
as well as the other developmental delays, suicide, and other mental health issues that other members have mentioned earlier. So as midterm elections approach, uh, a leaked memo on February 24th from the largest Democratic polling and strategy firm, Impact Research, has told Democratic candidates to declare victory on COVID as people are fed up. So let's keep an eye on our politicians and the decisions they make as the elections approach. It looks like it's already happening. Again, this appears to be politics, not science or ethically based. And given that this board has followed the guidance of the Board of Health for the last two years, largely without question, I find it incredible that we would consider not following their guidance. Just the other day, they voted three nothing to end the masking. We don't need arbitrary metrics, targets, or anything else, just parental choice. That's all we're asking. And if the Board of Health decides to bring this nonsense back after the midterms, we, the parents, will then take it up with them. Thank you all for your time. Thanks so much. So that concludes our public comment portion of the meeting and all of our friends from the community can kindly leave the public meeting and head over to YouTube if you'd like to continue watching. Thanks everybody, see you later. All right, so the next item on our agenda is the approval of the minutes and I'll turn it over to Mr. Horish with uh, perhaps a motion. All right, thank you. I'll move to approve the meeting minutes of February 9th, 2022. Second. Okay. Thanks, Rich. Any discussion? Can you guys hear me okay? Yeah, okay, good. I'm leaning. All right, so without discussion, I'll move forward with the vote. Mary? Yes. Myself, yes. Joe? Yes. Sharon? Yes. Amy? Yes. Mike? Yes. Karen? Yes. Sean? Yes. Brett? Yes. Rich? Yes. Steve? Yes. Excellent. Motion passes. So everybody, um, the first item up for uh, discussion here is the budget deliberation. So as you guys probably know, we'll take our vote on the budget at the next meeting. Uh, which I believe is the 15th, correct me if I, mm, the 9th, excuse me. So the 9th, we will vote on the budget. Um, we do need a two thirds vote on that. Steve, correct me if I'm wrong. Two thirds vote. I think so. I'm not sure of that. Maybe and Mr. Everybody, Gleason could count. Yeah, Joe, two thirds vote on the budget, correct? Yep. Uh, so, this time here is for deliberation. Does anybody want to bring up anything that they're concerned about, something that should be discussed, anything that you heard at the hearing? And using your gold hand is really useful if you could do that. Hand <laughs> and, and say, um, the concern that was expressed by Lancaster is something that I am concerned about. I wonder if our Lancaster reps have a similar concern or if, if you think that um, we've done our very best here to move the budget in a direction that is as friendly as possible. Yeah, Sean. I'm kind of listening to Kirk and when, when he sort of says that it's sort of every town seems to take the burden or the hit based on the way that it's sort of designed. And so if this is our year, then I think it sort of uh, behooves us to sort of stand in front of the, the town meeting and sort of say, it might be our year and, um, and, and sort of um, advocate that, that, I don't know, evenness, that fairness. Thanks, Sean. Uh, Amy, what, what do you think? I, I had put my hand up because I had a question on a different topic. Yeah, that's fine. Go for it. So I'm just trying to wrap my head around um, the budget drivers and it looks like this is consistent um, well, I see if, 
see a few things, but my question really is around salaries being the biggest contributor to the increase in the budget. And um, that's typical, right? That's like, that is normally the biggest budget driver. But um, I think my question has to do with the fact that if there are no new FTEs, we're not creating any new positions and the salaries is the biggest budget driver. So that's, that's representing the cost of um, raises and benefits, fringe benefits, insurance, all that stuff is captured in that line item. Well, it would be increases in the COLA or increases in steps and lanes uh, based on the salary schedule. And then, yes, an increase in insurance benefits as well. And, you know, as one of the things that happened during the pandemic is uh, families made choices um, and involve some of those choices that they make is changing insurance um, in terms of which uh, person in the household might be carrying the insurance. So as we look at that here in the school system, that's part of the increase in the insurance and benefits as well. Go ahead, Joe. Uh, thank you, Madam Chairman. Um, I wanted to uh, respond to your question <clears throat> relative to uh, Lancaster and the uh, fiscal year 23 budget, uh, but I'm going to respond to it in part because my other part of my question is a procedural one. So looking at the agenda, we had our public hearing, we closed our public hearing, we are now into deliberation, but our vote on the budget won't be until our next meeting in March, which would be March 9th. Correct, you'll be asking for a vote at that time. Okay, so relative to Lancaster, if we're gonna vote on the budget on uh, the 9th, that would leave additional opportunity for further deliberation on the vote. So relative to, because you're gonna have to move to approve the vote, approve, excuse me, approve the budget. And then of course there'll be discussion at that point. So I, I'm, as one member, one quarter fourth of the Lancaster contingency, I'm a little bit torn at this point. Um, in, in fairness, uh, being the senior member of the Lancaster contingency, I mean, I've heard the same concerns over the past three years. Um, for some reason this year seems to be a little bit more elevated, more exasperated. So I'm a little bit torn at this point, but I think at this point, as far as one fourth of Lancaster, I'm kind of at a point where I wanna hold off need another week and give the matter some further thought and talk to some people in town, especially on the select board and the FinCon and see where we stand. Thanks, Joe. I apologize, my house is noisy. If, if you hear anything strange. Uh, go ahead, Steve. Madam Chair, um, it's my understanding that when um, the budget comes to the towns at town meeting, uh, two of the three have to approve. It, I think you mentioned before that it had to be unanimous, but it's not unanimous. I believe my understanding is that two of the three towns have to approve the budget. Um, so I don't think I said it was unanimous. If I did, Madam I Chair, I said it was unanimous in regards to approving the new high school building. Oh, yes. Yeah. So for those capital projects, all three yeah. towns have to approve. Right. That's but for the budget, yeah, I think you're right, Steve. It's just two out of the three two towns three. need to approve. Right. Yeah. Yes. More, Steve. Go ahead. I, yeah. I, I don't mean to upset my my esteemed colleague. Uh, Attorney Gleason on that, but um, unfortunately, if your town is growing financial, growing wealth-wise and growing student-wise, these are, these are how the allocations are, are divided. And uh, I'm, I know he, he is well aware of that, uh, having been involved in budget formation before, but, um, and it's all relative, Stowe, Stowe is, remained uh, static 
We don't have any major new developments occurring. Um, Bolton does, and Lancaster does as well. And, and remember that uh, pretty much two thirds of that budget is determined by the state and not by the, uh, not by this, the uh, administration. And the administration breaks it up based upon population of the school over a five-year rolling average. Okay, thanks, Steve. Go ahead, Sean. I, I think both my uh, colleagues, uh, both Steve and, uh, and, and Joe, sort of bring up a good point. Um, the other thing that when we were sort of in the union negotiations without sort of disclosing too much was even to bring them into a percentage, it still put them under um, minimum wage. And so we had that challenge in front of us where you sort of saw Kurt just sort of go, you know what, here's the right thing to do to bring them up into sort of that standard as far as making the show of us sort of that point where they want to stay. Not, not where you want to sort of hire, but where you want them to stay. And, and I think he, he handled it very delicately where he said, it's going to make an impact on the towns. And based on those percentages, Lancaster is going to catch a hit. And, um, and, and Bolton and, and Stowe sort of spoke up and said, yeah, we can do this and this and this. But at the end of the day, I, it seemed to be the right thing to do for the staff and the administration because we need those you know, we, we need those, um, uh, we need that support staff. And so to keep them sort of in place, um, I think we need to do the right thing. So you're, you're gonna see a bounce in that number, but it only brings them above, you know, sort of respectful minimum wage. And, and maybe Kirk can more delicately speak to that. Mr. Windsor, I think you're referring to that, that's a pocket of some of our unit C employees. Yeah. Uh, part of that bargaining group. Um, that would be true for some of our unit C employees. And if you remember, I brought to you earlier this year an increase in the substitute rate for that same very reason um, to make sure we're, we're staying competitive in the marketplace. I would actually add, I think it's interesting that you're not asking for additional positions this year. And so the drivers are the right. salaries really of existing personnel. And as our student population is relatively flat from last year to this year. I That's mean, right. you might imagine that you're, you're gonna need the same amount of staff members, although you were very creative in reallocating some retirement positions, et cetera, um, right. and kind of wrapping the 1.5 additional FTE into other places. So you're not asking for any additional staff. This is really just about contract mandated COLAs and the salary schedule that is, you know, per individual, fairly modest. But there are a lot of amazing people who work for us and who care for our children. And it's all part of the calculus. I think that's kind of what Sean was getting at too. Exactly, thank you. Anybody else have any questions or comments? All right, seeing none, I'm looking to move to our next agenda item. And that is um, policy EBCFA, face coverings. And Kirk has a short presentation that he'd like to share with us that is in the meeting materials. So I'll turn it over to you, Kirk. Thank you very much. Let me get queued up here. Madam Chair, that should be shown on your screen now. Yes. So as I've as I've been thinking about uh, uh, presenting uh, to you all tonight on this topic, even since I last wrote to the committee, uh, to the community, we've received more information, more development, and a couple of our, our folks in public speak tonight referred to those shifting sands that we tried to negotiate. And I really appreciated the comments of everyone is working in the best interests, what they believe are the best interests of kids and the best interests of our community. Um, and so based upon, uh, uh, what I'm going to show to you tonight, I will bring forward my recommendation that we do go to optional masking. So to remind everyone of the timeline, governance, and, and I know our, our community has wanted quicker action, but, but we are uh, a product of governance. And this committee adopted uh, that policy 
August 25th of 2020, of which we are currently under. It was superseded by the DESE DPH masking mandate for this school year up until the expiration of that mandate on February 28th, at which time our school system reverts back to what's the adopted policy of the school committee that was passed on that date. So what's changed from then to today? Well, in August 2020, we're in remote and hybrid learning. Vaccines are not available. There's no comprehensive testing structure. We only had six months in the uh, uh, pandemic, six months of experience at that time. And masking and distancing were the two best tools we had to manage the pandemic. Well, today we have students in school full time. Vaccines are available to people of all ages, uh, to ages five and older. We have weekly COVID safety checks in our school. We have uh, testing available uh, at home antigen kits for our families. Um, we have two years of experience of understanding the impact of these things. And the onset of the Omicron variant, which we did not see coming uh, at end of November, uh, middle of November, end of November, into that time. Uh, and that has really changed the ball game in terms of exposure and um, how, what we need to do in terms of how we think of the pandemic as we shift into endemic. How do we look today? Here's today's data across our schools. Uh, you'll note that um, we've had two cases up to date. I think a third case was reported today. But I want to share with the committee right now, we uh, did COVID safety checks on the students at Florence Sawyer, both buildings, yesterday. Over 400 students were tested. We had zero positive cases out of all those tests. So you can see these numbers have dropped dramatically uh, since the peak of the Omicron uh, variant. That positivity rate is also reflected in our communities as they have decreased significantly over the same period of time. We look at our Middlesex County trend reflects the same data points. So now we're, we're reaching daily case rates that are reflective of uh, late August this year. Same in Worcester County, same in Massachusetts. And when we look at the Boston wastewater data as a leading indicator for knowing if there is a symptomatic spread happening in the community, we are at the lowest points in that it, uh, uh, measurement uh, since this past summer. So there was an original recommendation made to the Neshoba Regional School Committee on the 18th to begin on March 7th to adopt uh, the model policy. And that model policy spoke to a face covering being strongly recommended for those who uh, remain unvaccinated. You're not required to wear a mask. Uh, students and staff returning from five day quarantine following a positive COVID test would follow strict mask use when eating, except when eating, drinking or outside and monitoring that through 10 days of the point of exposure. Masks would still be required in all school health offices and by federal public health order, all students and staff are required to wear a mask on school buses. Well, since that date, things have changed. So I would like to revise that recommendation to the Neshoba Regional School Committee by combining the first two to read, individuals are not required to wear a mask, but may do so if desired. A face covering that covers the nose and mouth is strongly recommended to be worn by individuals who remain unvaccinated or otherwise anyone compromised in school buildings and on school grounds even when social distancing is observed. Maintaining uh, the five-day quarantine uh, uh, following a positive test and then mask, uh, excuse me, returning from the five-day quarantine following a positive case to use a mask when, except when eating, drinking, or outside through the 10th day of exposure. And then of course, keeping uh, the mask requirement in health offices, as is common in our doctor's offices. So you can see, here's where I've taken those first two pieces and combined them into the first point as amended. Bullets three and four remaining the same. And bullet five to be eliminated because by uh, the federal order on uh, bus transportation has been lifted, so it's no longer necessary. Uh, in the recommendation. 
So again, it will, the recommendation would read uh, these three bullets. And how are we gonna support our students? Uh, through classroom discussions, particularly at the youngest grades about choosing to wear a mask. It's important for students to, to understand norms, to be able to understand how to support each other. But because it has been, as noted earlier this evening, such an emotional issue, we've seen examples of students carrying those emotions into the school in a way that could uh, you know, potentially make the students feel as if uh, they're being singled out, whether they're wearing a mask or not wearing a mask. So uh, our teachers need to have an opportunity to work with students on that. Plus, I, I, I want us to remember, we do have students that have uh, anxiety disabilities. They are receive services for how to handle and work on those anxieties, and that's a real thing. So our counseling uh, staff would have the opportunity over the next couple of days to work with those students who may need support. And I think most of all, the, the best way to transition back is just to go about business as usual, uh, to my, not make light of it. It's not a celebration as much as, okay, it's a, it's, it's a return to, or for some of our younger students, the point at which we can operate in, and learn in our classrooms uh, without being masked. So then the question is, what if cases rise again? And this is the one that I've stood on over and over again, as we have had discussions going all the way back to August on what are the metrics we would use for masking and unmasking. And I've proposed many of those metrics and I've engaged in conversations with our community, both with, with uh, people who uh, endorse having the metrics and with people who do not endorse having the metrics. And I've had a chance to really think about that. And I think we need to continue to monitor case rates and the impact on attendance in school. But I think most importantly, we need to follow the guidelines, regulations, and or local ordinances from each town's board of health. Um, someone this evening made reference to the Lancaster Board of Health lifting the mandate just recently, which was a significant move for the, the school system. So it would be my recommendation that we re-implement the mandated face covering policy town by town, if directed by the local boards of health. And, and the reason why I say that is because this experience has brought out that the pacing of our boards of health, particularly in the town of Lancaster, has matched what, what the community locally in our counties, in our state, across the nation um, are trending at the exact same time. As my superintendent colleagues are having these discussions and these presentations with their school committees uh, this week and in the week prior to the uh, February vacation. It just so happened this was when uh, we scheduled this and we added this uh, meeting to the agenda to handle this question tonight. So my recommendation is that we adopt the, the uh, model uh, MASC policy as amended and then in terms of re-implementation, we take the direction from our local boards of health to reinstitute the mandated face covering policy so that we as educators are no longer in the business of trying to break apart the health data and we can rely on those experts that are on uh, the boards of each of our towns. So with that, I'll take any questions from the committee. All right, everybody. So using that golden hand is a great tool. Please let me know if you have any questions for Kirk. Yeah, Mike. Um, thank you, um, Superintendent Darling. I'm just want to be clear that we are now um, doing away with a 90% attendance threshold as a metric to return to masking. Is that correct? Yeah, and I think where I've evolved in this question, particularly in the last two weeks and, and, and reading the material that has come out of uh, the CDC, um, the information that our own town of Lancaster has put forward, that I wouldn't seek authorization to reinstate. Rather, I think we should follow the, the, the guide of our health professions that are in our, our towns as our boards of health. Our Neshoba boards of health works as a, a collaborative for all the towns, so they don't speak for the towns. They just provide the services collectively that the town needs. Like for instance, they were a big part of contact tracing. So it really comes down to each town's board of health. 
And each of our towns instituted what they thought was the best move in their judgment. Lancaster instituted a policy that didn't have a time restraint, but they had some metrics tied to that that they recently lifted last week. The town of Bolton did the same earlier in, at the beginning of January, but they set a sunset date of February 28th. And the town of Stroll did that for municipal buildings, which I can only assume that they did that because we were already under DESE orders and didn't include us in that umbrella. So the 90% metric was, was simply a tool to gather and have discussions to investigate the need to, it wasn't a trigger point. Um, but I think what it does for everyone that, that clearly I've learned over the last couple of weeks is interpretation of what that, that point means only causes confusion. So this is where I think we come back to uh, working with our boards of health on making that decision on if we ever had to return to masking in schools again. Thank you. Amy. Yeah, I, uh, I just wanna thank Superintendent Downing for all of the reflective thinking that went into this presentation. And, um, you know, it's obvious that um, you've taken into consideration all the feedback that people have provided and, and worked it into your final recommendation. And I think it makes a lot of sense the way that you've proposed to um, leave the decision to reinstitute masking up to a local board of health because they are the ones who are the experts um, and have their finger on the pulse of, of all of the information that would feed into that decision. Um, the only question I have with regard to the policy that MASC has put forward is about the quarantine period that's described in there. And, you know, that's something that has also changed with time and just wonder if it's necessary to specify a five day quarantine within the policy. The, whether the, make those are sense. still the health, those are still the health metrics that, that are required if you positive, if you test positive for COVID. This policy refers to your return from quarantine. Yes, I'm wondering if we could rephrase it that way, a return from quarantine and just remove the reference to five days. It, it might be a small point, but um, you know that used to be 10 days, now it's five days, who knows what will, it will be going forward. Um, Ms. Cohn, if, I, if yeah. I hear what you're saying, you would just um, strike out five day and it would read students and staff returning from quarantine. Yeah. I, I just, could support that. I think that's just like a little simpler and might save us some work if that changes again. Um, Thank you. I, I, I certainly would uh, include that in on the, um, I've changed that on, on the Google doc I have of the policy here to delete the five day. If, if the other members are in agreement, I mean, that, that's just my thought. Are you talking about the, um, the five days that describes the quarantine or the five days that describes the masking upon return? It reads because students and staff returning from five day quarantine. What uh, Ms. Cohen has pointed out is that statement from the model policy is flawed because not all quarantine periods are exactly five days. Some quarantine periods could be longer than that. So rather than name it, just say returning from quarantine. Yeah. Uh, to the committee members, anybody opposed to Kirk making that shift on the fly? Okay, seems smart. Amy, something else? Well, the only other question I have for Superintendent Downing is, um, you know, I, I was, I think coming to this meeting with the feeling that I would be in support of granting you authorization to reinstate a mask mandate if you felt it was necessary, if you felt it was a necessary mitigation strategy needed to keep students and staff safe. But after hearing your presentation, it sounds like your, um, your preference would be to follow whatever ordinances the local towns decide is necessary. 
I, I think there's two pieces to that, Ms. Cohen. Mm -hmm. One is, let's just have our policy be crisp and clean. This is what our face covering policy is. And when we're talking about making medical uh, decisions based on medical and health conditions out in our community, it is, the it is the function and the mission of our departments of health to monitor the public health of our communities. And those are the bodies by which we should be taking direction from. So uh, as, as I've thought about that more and more, and we've tried to work on this, I, I've had, uh, uh, if, if you don't mind me saying, Attorney Gleason, I've had many conversations about this with Attorney Gleason in some of the rooms we've been in. Um, I've evolved on that in recent weeks because I think it just makes sense if we're gonna if we're gonna continue to abide by how these policies lie, we should be doing that based upon the direction of our our public bodies that are in charge of that. All right, I'd like to maybe see if any other members of the committee would like to weigh in. Yeah, I'm sorry, right. I can't find my hand. Oh, that's okay. Go ahead, Karen. <laughs> okay, um, I think this is well. First of all, I I really appreciate uh, Superintendent Downing hearing you kind of talk about that shift in your thinking. I think it really makes a lot of sense for the Board of Health to be um, the body in charge of making this decision on a townwide basis and not the school committee specifically to school. So I really appreciate that. I just wanna clarify something. In the third part about the, the part three about the quarantine, I just have a question about the through 10, day 10 of exposure. And this is, it's a minor thing, but I just wanna make sure people understand it. So for example, my son had COVID. I knew he was exposed on a certain day, but he didn't test positive for six days. So are you saying 10 days from the day of exposure or 10 days from when you test positive? Because they could be drastically different days. And I just want to make sure people are really clear on what that means. Yes, it is uh, from the 10th day of exposure. Okay. I am going to ask uh, Nurse Gilbecki if she is in the room to speak to that. Yes, I am. So it, that, it, thank you for the question and thank you for having me here. It does get quite um, um, convoluted sometimes based on information that we have. So um, it's it's uh, onset of symptoms. So if, uh, for example, student or staff or anybody has symptoms, for example, on a Saturday, but doesn't test because they didn't have a test or didn't get to the doctors until Tuesday, it's the 10 day start on um, Saturday, the day of symptoms is day zero. And then the next day is day one goes to 10. Uh, if they are asymptomatic and never had symptoms, regardless of exposure to somebody else, um, it depends if they're vaccinated or unvaccinated, then it would be date of test. And that again is day zero moving forward. Um, the quarantine, if they choose not to do the, the test and stay that was not here, that's when the exposure comes in. But it's so it's changed a little bit now because we are no longer contact tracing or doing test and stay. We are providing the um, two tests a week if, if um, students and parents choose to do so and, and faculty by doing pool testing and um, home testing kits. Does that Thank answer you. your question? I it hope. does. Thank, Thank you. you. Great. Thanks, Karen. Thanks, Lisa. Any other questions? Or, you know, I'd also love to give the committee an opportunity just to kind of say where they're leaning if they're feeling like they're in favor of this. You know, we have that mechanism in our protocols that allows us to pull the committee prior to a vote. So I'd also love to give the committee the opportunity to kind of indicate what they're thinking. And if you'd rather not, that's okay too. Go ahead, Mike. Uh, thanks, Leah. Um, I, uh, I, I'm in favor of the recommendation. I'm gonna support the recommendation. And if my numbers are right, um, based on the emails since our last meeting, um, about 75% of people who communicated with the school committee um, are more or less in favor of uh, flexible masking as well. Um, we did receive um, some emails um, that, uh, you know, the, the other 25% that uh, wanted to, uh, want to contain, uh, 
retain the masking policy. Um, and from what I understand, um, there are, you know, there are students that will continue to mask regardless of what our policy moving forward is for reasons that are entirely valid and rightfully personal. And admittedly, I did not fully appreciate the need to provide, you know, that week long or multiple day lead time before um, changing to a different masking expectation. But uh, after hearing from residents and kind of reaching out to them directly, I hope, um, and I know that we spoke to this, uh, the superintendent spoke to this, but I really do hope that our administration has the structures um, that will be in place to support those kids who will either choose to continue to wear masks um, uh, or, or feel that they need to wear masks. Uh, for those that want to go to a flexible masking option immediately, in other words, um, tomorrow, and a, a few of the people who spoke during citizens' comments spoke to that. Um, I would note that there are others, your neighbors, my neighbors, who don't feel nearly as confident or safe about the decision, regardless of how you feel or how I feel, um, others do not feel that safe. And so I hope that we can honor that. Um, you know, at this point we've been masking in schools for two years um, and hopefully everyone can understand why we would need to remain fully masked for just a few more days in order to help build out those structures because um, some of our kids will begin to experience this level of differentness um, and that speaks directly to the social emotional concerns that um, a lot of our citizens spoke to um, during citizens comments. So I guess that's just a statement. Uh, it's not really a question, uh, but I am going to support this recommendation. Thanks, Mike. Would anybody else like to weigh in? Oh, oh go ahead, Karen. Um, I, I am also going to support it. And just to um, piggyback on what, what Mike said, I think um, clearly a lot of people would like this to end tonight. But I do think, you know, even thinking about that, it's it's eight o'clock and there may be some kids that are wearing masks and are nervous about taking them off and they're already in bed. So it would be really nice for those families to have a couple of days to just process with their kids and have those conversations and not feel like they're sending their kids to school tomorrow morning and saying, surprise, when they get up, we, you, some kids aren't going to be masked. That, that could be tough for some kids. So I think we're talking about two and a half days of school um, if, we, if we do vote to rescind the mask mandate. Um, and I also just wanted to say that I too went through and reread every single email that we've gotten since February 8th. And it was a large majority that are in favor of having that personal um, choice as parents. So um, I feel we do need to honor that, but um, just to have some patience and compassion for people who don't necessarily feel that way and are nervous about this, just to give them a little bit more time. Thanks so much, Karen. Rich, you're next. I just wanted to quickly say that I concur with my colleagues. And I just want to generally say that um, I appreciate all the thoughtfulness that has gone into this entire process. It's not an easy one. There's people that disagree both sides and um, I'm just proud to be part of this board, proud of our superintendent and um, but we have the opportunity to make this decision. Thank you. Thanks, Rich. Anybody else want to weigh in? Joe. Uh, thank you, Madam Chairman. I actually don't want to weigh in. I actually want to leave to inquire of Ms. Gobicki about something that the superintendent had said in regards to the recommendation. So with your permission, may I inquire of our nurse leader? Indeed. Thank you. Um, Ms. Gobicki, and please don't hesitate to correct me if I'm wrong, but if we go back two years when this pandemic started, and just as a personal observation, I felt that the leadership and the guidance that was given to this district by the local and regional boards of health was, um, and I'll use the word divergent. 
um, at that time. I, I, I didn't feel that, you know, that, that many of the recommendations were well thought out and, and helpful to the district. Now, perhaps that's the result of something novel and new when they were experiencing this on the run and what have you. But in regards to the superintendent's recommendation, his recommendation would be to rely on the local board to help. Would, could you, in, and I know this is your area of, of expertise and I don't want to feel, feel like you have to step on anybody's toes or anything like that, but can you help me with my limited level of confidence in the, the recommendations of the local boards of health? Have they learned significantly more in the last two years? Because it just didn't feel back two years ago that we were getting, you know, a, how shall I say it, a, a more of a consolidated assessment of the situation. Thank you for your question. And um, yes, I think I, I would have to say that um, two years ago, going back when we actually had our first case um, in our districts, um, we had um, members of the Neshoba Nisho um, Associated Boards of Health um, actually at our offices to, to discuss going through the case. Um, and it was brand new to them as well because it was a pandemic that they weren't prepared for um, or were not um, supported with. And it was um, many discussions with um, Boston epidemiologists to, to give us guidance at that point. Um, for um, uh, school districts as well as the local boards of health. So there were many meetings that happened very quickly so we could all process and be on the same page. So I think that's what you're alluding to that it's, you know, they learned and um, uh, really came forward and supported school districts as well as the community um, as time went on, but very quickly. Um, the school districts had to then, you know, respond to DESE and DPHs guidelines that were provided to us uh, from a group of uh, members um, from DPH, Jesse Boston, epidemiologists, and local boards of health. So, you know, we all learned very quickly um, at the beginning, and um, I do rely heavily on them now to make decisions with us as a school district. Um, and if it's one of those questions that there, we both hesitate with, we always uh, seek um, from epidemiologists at the state level. Okay, Joe. Yeah, I, I, I guess my question then, I'll uh, just follow it up quickly, Madam Chair. So I, I will just defer to Ms. Govicki on this. You, you have confidence in our, both our local and regional boards of health to, to make the appropriate recommendations in an expedited fashion should they need to in the, in the near future. I do from working with them for the past few years. Right. Most certainly do. Thank you, Madam Chair. Go ahead, Amy. Thanks. Um, I was, I think I raised my hand when we were still polling. You were looking for polling members. Um, but then I kind of want to follow up on what Joe said because, um, uh, so can I do both? Is that okay? The, related to the, what Joe was, Questioning Ms. Kovicki uh, about, so would the boards of health have the type of attendance data that the superintendent was proposing as a way to monitor whether a masking policy should be reinstated? What they'll have, Ms. Cohen, is any positive case that happens in the school goes into their positive case data. So like, okay. for instance, in the town of Stowe on their board of health page, they post all of their their cases as reported so it's duplicitous in that way um so the attendance data if if they're pausing that time they're going to be out so they may not have specifically the case data but i think this is going to be a shift for both nurse gobecki and i as we're going to focus more on the individual town boards of health as opposed to our regional board of health because i i think when we're looking at what those local mandates are that's where the discussions need to have more depth and that's what our 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 strategy in the future is going to be. Okay, thank you for clarifying that. Um, my back to polling where we where we are on this. I'm going to be supporting this measure. Um, that are the the new policy being proposed by the superintendent. I feel like it's the most reasonable approach, um, and I've spent so much time thinking about both sides of this issue. I've read all of the emails that have been sent by, you know, hundreds of members of our community. Um, and I think where I land with all of this is that 
my duty as an elected member to the school committee is to act in the best interest of all students. And I feel like this policy does that. Um, it allows students who, or families who would like their students to remove a mask to do so. It allows families who want their child to continue wearing a mask to do so. And I feel like it offers some protection and requiring a mask for people who have tested positive um, and are returning from quarantine or are entering the health office. Um, and um, I, like I said previously, I was prepared to support, um, you know, a, a motion that would authorize the superintendent to reinstate the mask mandate. But if his, if his, if his recommendation is to go with the local boards of health and their mandates, um, I will support that as well. So, Thanks, Amy. Yeah. Um, I prepared a little something that I would like to share with you guys as well. I hope that you don't mind if I read it, uh, if that's okay. Um, like all of you guys, this is you know happening to all of us as well. This is not something that you know school committees are absolved from. We're all living in this, these communities together. As a teacher, I go to work every single day. I wear a mask. I manage it with all of my students. I watch the impacts in every way, shape, and form. So I completely empathize with everyone who emails us because everything that everyone is saying is true to some extent. And um, especially when people speak to the imp impacts that this is having on their kids, nobody knows better than you. So I totally hear all of that and I, and I celebrate it. Um, school committees are unique in that we're not kind of allowed to assert what we think prior to a public meeting, um, because that would be, you know, deliberation in a way. And so people may interpret our silence or our, our kind of refusal to side as maybe indifference, but it's not that. We all have opinions. And um, if we're doing our job really well, we keep those opinions close and we allow everybody who shares with us to continue to inform that opinion until we vote. Um, I think that that's what, if we're responsible, that's what we do. So I am, you know, thinking about governance a lot lately and I'm digging into this matter and I find it absolutely perplexing that we have to make public health decisions. <clears throat> I'm looking at uh, the governance structure in our state and what I see is the Department of Public Health and the local boards of health that are 100% vested with these powers. And so I think that, um, especially with the MASC model policy, it's based upon the recent advisory from the Department of Public Health. That makes sense. Over the weekend, the CDC creating that structure to identify incident rates in towns and allowing those local authorities to kind of make calls based upon those incident rates, it all makes sense to me. What doesn't make sense is asking school committees to make public health decisions. So, you know, the second agency that I mentioned, the boards of health, by charter, they are vested with this power to create mandates. We saw them exercise this authority over the last few months in creating townwide mandates of one sort or another. <clears throat> so we know that they have this capability. And um, not only do they have the capability, but they have the authority from mass general law, from town charter, um, and, and all kinds of other founding documents. So it's clear to me that the power to create public health policy resides with the um, Massachusetts Department of Public Health and the Stowe, Lancaster, and Bolton boards of health. And at this time, the DPH and the boards of health um, have ruled that flexible masking is appropriate. And so I too support this recommendation. Um, I support it as a replacement of the old policy. I also support waiting until next Monday so that our educators and our families have the time they need to ready our kids for the transition. Um, it's paramount that all kids feel safe. That is first and foremost. And the transition must bring about an environment where those who wanna continue masking are supported and even encouraged to do so. And I really hope that everybody listening right now and everybody out there, all of our parents, 
will hear that and have that really mindful conversation with their kids so that they can support their friends at school who want to keep wearing masks. Um, I don't support the attendance metric either. Uh, I think that we need to leave that to the public health policy experts and um, I've already identified who they are. So in conclusion, for those of our those members in our community who are worried about this, what I would say to them is that these decisions are being made in the context of really high vaccination rates. The data dashboard said that our staff is 92% vaccinated. That's just an astronomical number. And our kids, our buildings, they're all you know heading to 70% and well beyond, especially at the high school. But I warn against complacency and, and I want to say to our public health officials, if you ever think that remasking is necessary, I hope you will act quickly to create any necessary policies that will keep us all safe. So that's where I'm at. Go ahead, Joe. Uh, thank you, Madam Chairman. I, um, I, I take no exception to anything that you just said, except for, and I, and I always like to quote Don Henley when I say that you know, lawyers dwell on small details. And I, I think this is going, <laughs> I see Superintendent Downing has uh, got a smile on his face. He, you know, he's one of those appreciates my esoteric uh, uh, <laughs> leaning. So, um, I like the Eagles, Joe. I like. Okay. The <laughs> um, let me put my hand down because I, I I put it down originally because I think it's distracting when you're talking. So I apologize for that, Madam Chairman. Um, you know, I think that when you sit on a district committee like this, or you sit on any body politic, the the one luxury that you have is that you have the luxury of disagreeing uh, with your fellow committee members. And again, on the small detail that you just stated in your, your uh, uh, statement was, you had talked about the school committees and you know, our inability to uh, espouse our positions on certain issues. And there's a concern that, you know, that well, I, I don't know if I, I don't wanna be presumptuous here, but I know that the MASC has a standing policy or recommendation to district committees that say, listen, if you know it's a it's an issue of concern to your district, you should not project your position or vote in advance of the committee's deliberation. And I see you're nodding your head in agreement. And as per usual, Madam Chairman, I take exception and umbrage at the MASC's policy recommendation. I, I take the opposite approach. I think that in our position as district committee members, that the people who live in our communities have every right to know in advance of our meeting, in advance of our deliberations, where we stand on any particular issue. I, I agree we have to be mindful of the open meeting law. We don't want to be getting together in our communities and having discussions on this. But if you're walking down the street, just minding your own business, and somebody confronts you and says, hey, a vote's coming up on that masking policy. Where do you stand? I want to know right now. I think that person has every right to know. I think they need to know. And I understand the MAC's policy, they, you know, because deliberation could change your mind. Absolutely. I don't disagree with that. But in the moment, I think we all have that obligation responsibility if confronted. It's in, a, in your own prerogative. It's your own, excuse me, in your own prerogative. The state of the individual, listen, I stand with this thing. I, I haven't been asked, but if somebody did ask me what I said, I said, well, at present, my, rec my position is I'm going to support the recommendation of the superintendent. But so I, I'm sorry, I don't want to go on ad nauseum about this, Madam Chair. I just wanted to just give a counterpoint to your point on that. And I understand the MASC has its standing policy and recommendation on that, but I, I take I take the opportunity to just basically rise to an objection to the MASC's policy and just give a slight counterpoint to that minor detail. But I agree with everything else you said in, the, in your statement. Thank you. Thanks, Joe. I do like you taking on bridge at the MASC. Any other comments? Anybody else want to weigh in, Kirk? Madam Chair, when you are getting ready to, to take that motion, um, I believe if, if you were to take the motion as presented, you would need to have it presented first. So, so let me know when I'll present my screen. Uh, I've made the adjustment that Ms. Cohen had made as well. I think if you present it right now, that's totally fine. Okay. That new uh, version. Yeah. Does anybody else want to weigh in though? Go ahead, Steve. I just want to say I, I enjoy it whenever Mr. Gleason takes on Bridget anything. <laughs> anything. Thank you for that. Anyone else? All right. So we'll just wait for Kirk to bring up that um, new, slightly changed version. Okay. So here's the face covering policy. 
ABCFA, the Minnesota Regional School District, is committed to providing a safe environment in schools during the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic. Maintaining a safe environment is critical to the district's ability to ensure students remain in a full-time classroom learning environment. According to the public health experts, one of the best ways to stop the spread of the coronavirus is to keep members of the community safe is to use face masks or face coverings. Therefore, in accordance with guidance and recommendations from the Center of Disease Control, CDC, and the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education, and the Massachusetts Department of Public Health, the following requirements are in place until further notice. Individuals are not required to wear a mask, but may do so if desired. A face covering that covers the nose and mouth is strongly recommended to be worn by individuals who remain unvaccinated or otherwise immunocompromised in school buildings and on school grounds, even when social distancing is observed. Students and staff returning from quarantine following a positive COVID test must follow strict mask use other than eating, drinking, or outside and conduct active monitoring for symptoms through day 10 of exposure. Masks will be required in all school health offices. Thanks, Kirk. Uh, Mike. Uh, can I make a motion? Please do. I'm going to make a motion to adopt uh, policy EBCFA as presented, effective March 7th, 2022. Do I have a second? Second. second. Oh, I heard Mary. Thank you, Mary. Any further discussion? Go ahead, Mary. So, uh, and I really feel that this is the now is the time when a lot of what was going on is just polling should have been in here. And I say this um, just, just as, as protocol. <clears throat> and I, I think that perhaps um, something that Leah was saying about deliberation was in regard to some of the emails that we received saying <clears throat> that it was well evident that the committee had already discussed and people had already made up their minds and, um, and that was disconcerting to, to read that we were being accused of um, deliberation outside of a, a public meeting. So I wanted to bring that up. And I also wanted to thank the many, many people who did um, respond and give us their opinion. <clears throat> One of the things that I want to talk first about the people who were giving reasons for not keeping for, for keeping masks. And, uh, and it was probably about 25%. <clears throat> and I understand, and I, everybody on this committee understands the concerns. And I just want to, nobody has really articulated, uh, people have referenced it, but when you have younger children who are too young to be vaccinated and might, and might you know, be, have cancer, have, have other, um, you know, their, their immune system is compromised, that parents are really, you know, scared and worried. <clears throat> One of the things that I, and so I, I do, that does resonate with me. Um, our first child died of um, complications of a virus and um, perfectly healthy. And so I don't want to discard or, or um, discredit in any way <clears throat> people's fears of that. However, we are in public education and we make decisions for the benefit of all of our students and also for the common good. And so in making our decisions, we have to think about everyone. And um, I have to say that one thing that I really resented was the tone of many of the people who were saying immediately stop all the masks, um, a demanding strident, angry tone and that tone, I understand because we're all angry about um, you know, the pandemic and what we've lost and for our children and what they have lost. And, and I would say that, thank God, none of them lost their lives. Um, but I, so I just, I have to say that because you know, this is my third year on school committee and, and I won't be running again. But I would say to the public, um, and many people were very respectful and thanked us for our service. But this is not an easy job. And, um, you know, to, I, I think that before people write some of these emails and are so strident and demanding and, um, and judgmental, they should think about the fact 
that this is public education. And when it comes to what's best for our children, absolutely parents are the first and best teachers. We are it. But when your children are in public education, there is something called the common good. And so we have to make decisions, what's best for everyone. And, you know, as we look back, the board, not only the boards of health have, um, have so much more knowledge now, but, you know, everything is 2020 now looking back and we can say, oh, masks, you know, poo-pooing masks, et cetera. But that's all we had in the beginning. And so I understand the anger. I would just ask people going forward, don't direct the anger toward the school committee. Um, be respectful. This is public service and this is public education. And parents do not make the decisions as to their children in public education. There is homeschooling, there is private schooling, but this is public education. And so we have to make a decision um, for what's best for all of our students. And, and I am in support of, of, of going forward with what Superintendent Downing um, has recommended, but I just wanted to, to thank everyone who sent anything to us in terms of an email for the respectful, um, it, that, that res the respect that was given us, not saying that we had deliberated. I mean, that was not respectful and it's not true. We did not deliberate. And this, this doesn't go against what Joe was saying. This was an accusation that we had already decided on things and perhaps some people might have, but we have been carefully considering what is best for all the children in the Neshoba Regional School District. And um, that's it. Thanks, Mary. All right, everybody. So I'm, I'm seeing one more golden hand. Go ahead, Sharon. One more golden hand. I'm gonna put it down. Um, everyone has spoken so eloquently and, and so many of the thoughts um, that I have had as I've been reading all of the emails and thinking about all of this, but I think that we if we were to think back to two years ago when this began and we came together as a community facing something that we knew nothing about and we came together to support one another um, to try to understand this and make our way through it. We have knowledge now that we did not have two years ago. So we make we were always making these decisions in a reactive kind of way um, because there, we were making decisions as the information came along. It was, it was what we had available to us. But we came together with compassion um, to support all of our community through something that we just was brand new and we didn't understand. Right now, we have an opportunity to come together and to support with compassion all of our community again. I read those emails and I feel the frustration of, of families who feel like they have been wanting the mask mandate to be lifted for months. I feel their frustration. I read the emails of the families who want to their want to keep the masking mandate, and I and I feel the fear, and I feel the anxiety, um, especially for those really the families with really young children. Those children are not eligible for vaccines yet. So while all the old, older children have the choice, or families with older children have the choice um, to vaccinate or not, those families do not have that um, have that option yet. And I and I feel compassion for their, their fear um, and the uncertainty. But I think overall, I will, I'm, I'm in wanting to support this motion, but I think what we what I would hope is that we would come together again as a community and show compassion for one another, regardless of the choice that families make um, and recognize that each family is making that decision um, based on what they believe is the right thing for them and the right thing for their children. And if, if children are wearing masks, that we will support that. And if children are not wearing masks, that we will recognize that that is uh, the choice that they are comfortable with as well. 
Thanks, Cher. All right, everybody. I am seeing no more golden hands. So I'm ready to take the vote. All those in favor of this motion, um, let's see. Mary? Yes. Myself, yes. Joe? Yes. Sharon? Yes. Amy? Yes. Karen? Yes. Mike? Yes. Sean? Yes. Steve? Oh, I didn't hear you, Steve. Thumbs up for yes. Excellent. Okay, thanks. Brett? Yes. Rich? Yes. And Sean? Uh, already voted, but yes. Oh, I'm sorry, Sean. Did you? Let's vote as long as it counts right. Thanks. All right, everybody. I think I got everyone. And the vote was unanimous. So I'll pass it over to you, Kirk. Yes, Madam Chair. I just want to let you know that um, while it's impossible for me to stay in front of social media, um, I've got to do my just best to stay in front of the local press and send out a quick announcement via email after this meeting of the vote tonight. Very good. I assume you'll also be messaging the community in addition to local media? No, I'm going to message our community. Uh, I think our local media is watching us closely. <laughs> uh, I, this is an email that will go out to our community in, in the traditional methods I use. Oh, very good. Thanks, Kirk. Yeah. That is all for our business tonight. Can I get a motion to adjourn? So moved. Thanks, Steve. Second. I think that was Amy seconding. Mm -hmm. So, Mary. Yes. I say yes. Joe? Yes. Sharon? Yes. Amy? Yes. Karen? Yes. Mike? Yes. Steve? Yes. Brett? Yes. Rich? Yes. And Sean? Yes. Thank you for your service, everyone.